ਜਸ ਪੰਜਾਬੀ ਦੇਖਦੇ ਹੋਏ ਸਾਰੇ ਦਰਸ਼ਕਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਮੇਰਾ ਪਿਆਰ ਭਰੀ ਸਤਿ ਸ਼੍ਰੀ ਅਕਾਲ ਤੁਹਾਡਾ ਸਵਾਗਤ ਪ੍ਰੋਗਰਾਮ ਅੱਜ ਦਾ ਮੁੱਦਾ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਮੈਂ ਤੁਹਾਡੀ ਹੋਸਟ ਆਸ਼ਮਿਤਾ ਦਿੱਲੀ ਪਹੁੰਚੇ ਆ ਦਿੱਲੀ ਤੋਂ ਤੁਹਾਡੇ ਨਾਲ ਇਸ ਸਪੈਸ਼ਲ ਪ੍ਰੋਗਰਾਮ ਲੈ ਕੇ ਹਾਜ਼ਰ ਹੋਇਆ ਤੁਸੀਂ ਜ਼ਰੂਰ ਨਿਊਜ਼ ਵਿੱਚ ਵਕ-ਵਕ ਅਪਡੇਟ ਸੁਣੀਆਂ ਹੋਣੀਆਂ ਕਿ ਇਸ ਮੋਰਚੇ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਇੱਕ ਹੋਰ ਅਗਰ ਆਪਾਂ ਕਹਿ ਸਕਦੇ ਆ ਸਪਰੈਸ਼ਨ ਟੈਕਟਿਕ ਹੁਣ ਵੇਖਣ ਨੂੰ ਮਿਲ ਰਿਹਾ ਹੈ ਉਹ ਪੱਤਰਕਾਰਾਂ ਦੇ ਖਿਲਾਫ ਬਹੁਤ ਵੱਡੇ ਲੈਵਲ ਤੇ ਭਾਵੇਂ ਉਹ ਐਫ ਆਈ ਆਰਸ ਹੋਣ ਭਾਵੇਂ ਉਹ ਟਵਿੱਟਰ ਤੇ ਬਲੌਕ ਬਲੌਕਡ ਅਕਾਊਂਟਸ ਹੋਣ ਭਾਵੇਂ ਉਹ ਜਰਨਲਿਸਟ ਜਿਸ ਤਰ੍ਹਾਂ ਮੰਦੀਪ ਪੂਨੀਆ ਦੀ ਗੱਲ ਹੋ ਰਹੀ ਹੈ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਦੀ ਗ੍ਰਿਫਤਾਰੀ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਦੀ ਕਸਟਡੀ ਵਿੱਚ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਰੱਖਣਾ ਇਹ ਸਾਰੀ ਚੀਜ਼ਾਂ ਹੋਣ ਤੇ ਇਸ ਚੀਜ਼ ਤੇ ਅੱਜ ਥੋੜੀ ਜੀ ਤੁਹਾਡੇ ਨਾਲ ਗੱਲ ਕਰਨ ਜਾ ਰਹੇ ਹਾਂ ਪਰ ਜਿੱਥੇ ਪੱਤਰਕਾਰਾਂ ਦੀ ਗੱਲ ਆਂਦੀ ਹੈ ਉੱਥੇ ਇੱਕ ਇੰਡੀਵਿਜੂਅਲ ਜਰਨਲਿਸਟ ਨੂੰ ਛੱਡ ਕੇ ਇੱਕ ਗਰੁੱਪ ਆਫ ਜਰਨਲਿਸਟ ਦੀ ਜਦੋਂ ਗੱਲ ਆਂਦੀ ਹੈ ਇੰਡੀਆ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਇੱਕ ਇਹੋ ਜੀ ਸੰਸਥਾ ਦੀ ਐਡੀਟਰਸ ਗਿਲਡ ਆਫ ਇੰਡੀਆ 70s ਤੋਂ ਐਗਜ਼ਿਸਟ ਕਰਦੀ ਹੈ ਜਦੋਂ ਇੱਥੇ ਐਮਰਜੈਂਸੀ ਹੋਈ ਸੀ ਉਸ ਟਾਈਮ ਇਹ ਸੰਸਥਾ ਬਣੀ ਸੀ ਕਿ ਉਸ ਟਾਈਮ ਕੁਝ ਇਹੋ ਜੀ ਆਵਾਜ਼ਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਸਪਰੈਸ ਰੋਕਣ ਦੀ ਦਬਾਨ ਦੀ ਕੋਸ਼ਿਸ਼ ਕਰਕੇ ਇਹ ਸੰਸਥਾ ਬਣੀ ਸੀ ਕਿ ਐਡੀਟਰਸ ਨੂੰ ਜੋ ਪੱਤਰਕਾਰ ਹਨ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਦਾ ਇੱਕ ਆਪਣਾ ਗਰੁੱਪ ਹੋਣਾ ਚਾਹੀਦਾ ਤਾਂ ਕਿ ਇਹੋ ਜੀ ਚੀਜ਼ ਕਦੀ ਅੱਗੇ ਨਾ ਹੋਏ ਤੇ ਅੱਜ ਮਾਡਰਨ ਸੈਂਚਰੀ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ 2021 ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਜਿੱਥੇ ਸਾਨੂੰ ਇਹ ਚੀਜ਼ ਵੇਖਣ ਨੂੰ ਮਿਲ ਰਹੀ ਹੈ ਐਡੀਟਰਸ ਗਿਲਡ ਆਫ ਇੰਡੀਆ ਦੇ ਆਪਣੇ ਮੈਂਬਰਸ ਵੀ ਇਸ ਚੀਜ਼ ਵਿੱਚ ਤੁਸੀਂ ਕਹਿ ਲਓ ਬਿਨਾ ਆਪਣੇ ਚੂਜ਼ ਕੀਤੇ ਹੋਏ ਇਨਵੋਲਵ ਹੋ ਚੁੱਕੇ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਦੇ ਕੁਝ ਮੈਂਬਰਸ ਦੇ ਖਿਲਾਫ ਵੀ ਐਫ ਆਈ ਆਰਸ ਦਰਜ ਹੋਈ ਹੈ ਅੱਜ ਮੈਂ ਤੁਹਾਡੀ ਮੁਲਾਕਾਤ ਕਰਾਉਣ ਜਾ ਰਹੀ ਹਾਂ ਮਿਸਟਰ ਸੰਜੇ ਕਪੂਰ ਜੀ ਦੇ ਨਾਲ ਜੋ ਕਿ ਐਡੀਟਰਸ ਗਿਲਡ ਆਫ ਇੰਡੀਆ ਦੇ ਜਨਰਲ ਸੈਕਟਰ ਹਨ ਜਨਰਲ ਸੈਕਟਰੀ ਹਨ ਤੇ ਉਹ ਸਾਨੂੰ ਦੱਸਣਗੇ ਥੋੜੀ ਜੀ ਹਿਸਟਰੀ ਇਸ ਸੰਸਥਾ ਬਾਰੇ ਕੀ ਕੁਝ ਉਹ ਅੱਜ ਦੀ ਡੇਟ ਵਿੱਚ ਕਰ ਰਹੇ ਤੇ ਕਿੱਥੇ ਜਿੱਥੇ ਜਰਨਲਿਜ਼ਮ ਦੀ ਗੱਲ ਆਂਦੀ ਹੈ ਖਾਸ ਕਰਕੇ ਜਰਨਲਿਜ਼ਮ ਦਾ ਰੋਲ ਇੱਕ ਇੰਡੀਪੈਂਡੈਂਟ ਇੱਕ ਫ੍ਰੀ ਡੈਮੋਕ੍ਰੇਸੀ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਕਿੰਨਾ ਵੱਡਾ ਰੋਲ ਹੁੰਦਾ ਹੈ ਤੇ ਕੀ ਚੀਜ਼ ਅੱਜ ਜਰਨਲਿਜ਼ਮ ਇਸ ਪੱਤਰਕਾਰੀ ਦੀ ਫੀਲਡ ਨੂੰ ਇੰਡੀਆ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਖਤਰੇ ਚ ਪਾ ਰਹੀ ਹੈ ਤੁਸੀਂ ਇਸੇ ਤਰ੍ਹਾਂ ਸਾਡੇ ਨਾਲ ਜੁੜੇ ਰਹੋ ਐਂਡ ਮੈਂ ਤੁਹਾਨੂੰ ਇੱਕ ਹੋਰ ਥੋੜੀ ਚੀਜ਼ ਦੱਸਣਾ ਚਾਹੁੰਦੀ ਹਾਂ ਕਿ ਇਹ ਪ੍ਰੋਗਰਾਮ ਇਹ ਇੰਟਰਵਿਊ ਆਪਾਂ ਇੰਗਲਿਸ਼ ਵਿੱਚ ਕੀਤਾ ਹੈ ਵਾਂਸ ਅਗੇਨ ਮਾਫੀ ਮੰਗਦੀ ਹਾਂ ਪੰਜਾਬੀ ਚ ਨਹੀਂ ਇਹ ਇੰਗਲਿਸ਼ ਵਿੱਚ ਕੀਤਾ ਹੈ ਤਾਂ ਕਿ ਇਹ ਜੋ ਮੈਸੇਜ ਹੈ ਇਹ ਜੋ ਦਿੱਲੀ ਤੋਂ ਸਾਡੀ ਰਿਪੋਰਟਿੰਗ ਹੈ ਨਾ ਕਿ ਸਿਰਫ ਤੁਹਾਡੇ ਤੱਕ ਪਹੁੰਚੇ ਬਟ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਸਾਰਿਆਂ ਤੱਕ ਪਹੁੰਚੇ ਵੈਸਟਰਨ ਮੀਡੀਆ ਤੱਕ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਤੱਕ ਜਿਨ੍ਹਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਹਿੰਦੀ ਪੰਜਾਬੀ ਨਹੀਂ ਵੀ ਆਂਦੀ ਸੋ ਇੱਕ ਵਾਰੀ ਫਿਰ ਇੰਗਲਿਸ਼ ਵਿੱਚ ਹੋਏਗਾ ਇੰਟਰਵਿਊ ਤੁਸੀਂ ਕਿੱਥੇ ਨਾ ਜਾਓ ਮਿਲਦੇ ਹਾਂ ਬ੍ਰੇਕ ਤੋਂ ਉਸ ਪਾਰ My name is Sanjay Kapoor. I am the editor of Har News magazine and the general secretary of Editors Guild of India, which is the apex body of editors in this country. And you can say it's some kind of conscience keeper trying to ensure that certain values are adhered to and also ensure excellence in journalism. Uh, I've been a journalist for the last 30 years. I've, been, I've worked for various publications. I used to be the bureau chief of a now defunct newspaper called blitz it was india's greatest tabloid as they used to call it themselves and then i worked with the time warner group asia week editor of uh, midday and then advise a tv channel there thereafter i started my own publication so here i am uh, happy to talk to you sir it's a pleasure to speak with you as well um i want to start by talking a little bit about this organization the editors guild of india the watchdog the apex kind of um you know when you talk about who's watching the watchers this organ
as the general secretary of editors guild this uh, incidentally this is the first time editors guild had an election otherwise it was always uh, something they would draw, build a consensus around a name and they would have it uh, it happened without any seamlessly for many years but this time in october we decided to have an election so that there could be more representation on top of that you know we realized that it was becoming very delhi centric and there were editors all over the country they needed to participate so uh, we had an election uh, technology allowed us to do that we had uh, use email to vote and there were some safeguards that we you know built around that but uh, we had this election and before that there were demands that in uh, that egi should be far more proactive than what it is because the pressure on media had begun to increase mm. in the last few years and uh, there was uh, also reluctance on the part of many that there should not be too much of aggression because mm. it could be counterproductive but anyway there was a desire that the editors guild's voice should be heard and they drew precedent with uh, many uh, times when editors guild had i think enlightened editors who took up issues there were people of such eminence like uh, bg varghese who is no more and a few more people and they keep on uh, reminding us about how editors uh, you know woke up to state intervention and how they kept on challenging mm-hmm. so there was a certain amount of uh, you can say institutional memory of how editors can stand up to it but uh, if going back to your question about uh, whether there have been uh, you know how the egi has performed the most famous incident is when uh, there was a bihar press bill to uh, you know on defamation and to control uh, press freedom mm-hmm. and nearly all the editors stepped out they walked in the, on uh, the central vista in new delhi and demanded that the entire bill should be repealed mm-hmm. and that really worked i think it managed to bring in a civil society support ji. and the government uh, wilted under pressure ji. so uh, something of that nature has been expected of media from time to time especially from eji from egi but uh, circumstances sometimes allow you to just go ahead with a statement and do nothing but uh, now i think uh, with the government which uh, has uh, in a way orchestrated an environment where i think more resistance probably required uh, the eji is also doing a bit ji um once again mr kapoor you know we're having this conversation it's early february 2021 um india specifically delhi which is where we are we're sitting here in your home in delhi um is uh, without being over dramatic under siege so to speak um at the moment you know and the media has now come under a special spotlight um as of the last few days even more so than uh the role of the media has been in this entire agitation this farmers agitation um you and i were talking and we we're talking a little bit about um the role of print publications specifically as the editors guild uh works with versus the role of television in modern day india right um tell me a little bit about how uh you know today's uh, journalism uh the the kind of uh, uh differences that exist when it comes to tv journalism versus uh traditional print publications and the kind of editors that are members of the guild it's a long question you know and i need to pick out to what i should respond to but uh, this is these are very extraordinary times i mean uh, i've been a journalist past 30 35 years and i have seen all kinds of demonstration protests take place in delhi and even a farm protest a farmer protest took place uh, Uh, spearheaded by the father of the present uh, leader of the protest a gentleman called Rakesh Tikat his father was Mahendra Tikat and i have uh, memories of him occupying the boat club lawns in delhi and he just refused to leave so uh, i think authorities have always uh, mentioned that, that you know uh, we have to stop the protesters from coming into delhi especially to central delhi find a way to stay keep them away tell them to go elsewhere if there is some kind of deal making that has to be done it should be done so that in a say in a certain way has been the operating principle the standard operating procedure in some way when it comes to dealing with protest but this time i think it just they just mismanaged it so badly but the only thing they wanted to manage was the headlines they wanted to manage the media when you say they who do you they mean the government the gave the government the authorities i said the authorities Ji. used to normally issue you know shoot them away cut deals do whatever but this time uh, 
I think they just mismanaged. They allowed them to come in for whatever may be the reason. And the siege has been going on for the past two months and before that for earlier for two, two months at the Punjab border. And uh, these are, you know, in a certain way, uh, strange uh, times. And uh, the media is certainly at the, cent at the center, right at the front of the entire conversation, which is happening or not happening between the government and the farmers or even reporting that. So you wanted to ask me, uh, what is it uh, so different about the TV reporters reporting or the print? But I can tell you the Editors Guild of India represents also a lot of TV journalists, a lot of TV editors, not journalists so much, but a lot of TV editors. So we are cognizant about the medium, how it operates and also with uh, the print. But print is now slowly gravitating towards uh, the online version, which also moves pretty fast. It's almost at the same pace as that of uh, the TV media. And uh, we know that uh, whatever may be the nature of the media, but there are certain standards and the values that every publication needs to adhere to. And that is that you need to check your facts, although it's an evolving story and it can change uh, quite a bit. But the facts have to be checked before things have to be shot out. Because what has happened that uh, now the government and the power that it wields managed to tar anything as fake news. Hmm. Because in the last four or five years, uh, not it, ne it was never like this before, but in the last four years, Everything can be rubbish as fake, fake news and uh, serious reporting uh, can be, come under a cloud because the government disagrees with it. So there is nothing which is in a certain way uh, you can say absolute in, uh, in journalism today. Everything has a flip side. Uh, so even if you are reporting but you do from a different standpoint, the government would say that you know you are from the left and you see things in a different way so, and uh, you know it may start disputing it. This is exactly what happened uh, in, uh, you know, the violence that took place on the 26th of January. Uh, news, as you know, is an evolving, uh, you know, idea or happening. You may see a snapshot at a particular moment, but it may get another interpretation thereafter, maybe after the more details come in. Mm. And uh, on the day that one of the farmers <coughs> died, uh, there were early tweets which were coming in, say, suggesting that he may have been killed by a bullet. And thereafter, the matter was disputed by uh, the police and the authorities claiming that he died because the, uh, the tractor turned turtle. And that is the reason why he kind of uh, got those injuries. But subsequent investigations suggest something else. But weirdly, what is happening is the people who belong to uh, the, uh, who support the party, who support the ruling party and support the government, they think that uh, this was an attempt to tarnish the image of the government and uh, they are, uh, you know, being very seditious in trying to bring, uh, you know, against the state by giving primacy to a report like this. Mm. So this <coughs> strategy of the government, which wasn't there earlier and which has begun to, uh, you know, become uh, acquired primacy is to weaponize sedition laws, which have been there for long years, have been mm -hmm. disputed. And uh, for the last three, four years, the number of people who have been slapped with sedition charges in the media have really spiked. Mm. And uh, they, they are I, more so. I was going to say, there's some recent incidents, specifically uh, where uh, current members of the guild are concerned. Um, and uh, specifically, if we talk about the events that took place on January 26th, just last week, um, tell us about how the members of the guild got uh, caught up in all of this, specifically where the sedition uh, laws are concerned. So I was actually driving at that. I mean, I have you know, meandered from some other direction, came in here. But uh, the um, sedition charges actually revolve around this particular incident with that person who died. He was going on a tractor. The police authorities say that uh, he died because of uh, the tractor, uh, you know, going upside down and the fellow hurt his head. <coughs> but his relatives and all the witnesses suggest that he was shot by somebody on the other side of the grill. And this is a matter which was reported, uh, or tweeted actually, tweeted by a senior editor who was a member of the Guild, as well as the fact that he was a former president of the Guild, who said it's believed that uh, he, uh, the person, uh, Navkirat Singh, I think, was killed by a bullet. Uh, then there were other reports which came in from the government which said it's not true. 
and this kind of uh, you know uh, they, there were some trading of charges acquisitions which are coming in then later in the day we realized that uh, sedition FI, FIRs had been filed from different parts of the country more so in the northern area which suggested that uh, the this is going contrary to the police version mm. and uh, sedition uh, charges should be leveled against it the police promptly filed the FIR and then we realized that not one but there were many others and there's also a Congress MP Shashi Tharoor who was uh, who has to face similar charges. So in all about uh, seven editors have been uh, slapped with these charges. And yesterday only they went to the Supreme Court seeking relief because they want the quashing of the FIR. Mm. Editors Guild is right at the front line of uh, organizing this kind of support mm -hmm. from judges, uh, from not judges, from lawyers mm. and building a coherent strategy. So we are watching because uh, if the Supreme Court manages to quash these charges, then we need to go forward and ensure that uh, such charges do not uh, are not put irrationally on people who are reporting on the ground. Mm -hmm. Similarly, there was a young reporter who was reporting from uh, the Singhu border, and uh, his name is Mandeep Punia. Yeah, so Mandeep Punia uh, was charged not with uh, this thing, but not with sedition, but similar charges non of obstruction. Yeah, they were non-bailable. And um, he was put away for, I mean, till the, if he would not have got relief yesterday, he, he was to spend uh, 14 days Jeez. in judicial Jeez. custody. Jeez. And there again, I think Editors Guild came out with this very strong statement that these young courageous reporters are talking truth to power, mm -hmm. busting fake news, and they should be allowed to work without fear or favor. Jeez. So we did that. And I think we, we are also may not be standing alongside the young reporters at the front lines but we are keeping a close watch to ensure that uh, the core values of our uh, um, democracy are followed they are uh, people i mean the government should always remain mindful of that mm -hmm. and even the media which kind of is uh, split between the two sides one extremely and vociferously supportive of the, the government and there's one which is trying to be independent. So there are difficult times actually, Gee. but that is what is happening. Mr. Kapoor, you've been in this industry for 30 plus years. Um, surely back then it was a time where there were certain uh, ethics that journalists adhered to, right? Objectiveness uh, being uh, hopefully at the top of uh, th th that list. Um, would you say today in India, um, certain conditions have transpired that have caused, like you said, uh, a section of the media to stray from those ethics? I think what has happened that the consensus in our country has broken down, like in the US for that matter. I'm sure I know of uh, so many families <coughs> which uh, would not eat on the same table because there was one side which is supporting the former president, the others who thought that, you know, there was life beyond the president and, you know, they could carry on with their liberal ways of life. So similarly in India, things have been very, very, uh, you can say, uh, uh, you know, there is a kind of mood which doesn't allow any kind of space for the other point of view, which is happening and shows up in media, it shows up in uh, everyday life. And uh, I don't think the only context that can provide you to how it is different from that, because in the early days, uh, from the time when I started my journalism, there used to be largely, a, uh, you know, the Congress party, which was ruling the country. So on many issues, there used to be a consensus, despite the fact that you may have a different point of view on some religious matters, but on foreign policy, it'd be the same thing and, mm. and other matters also. But now it is totally different. Fundamentally, media has been subjected to great amount of uh, scrutiny. Mm. Every word that you write, and there are people who specialize in nitpicking and ensuring that uh, what you write uh, could be pinned against you. Sometimes you don't even realize what you what is being held against you. And mm. I've seen me people, uh, celebrities, people, commentators mm. who have uh, run into gone into major trouble. And there is so much of uh, what about theory which goes on. Like if you write something, people ask you, what about that? And why did you kind of raise those issues uh, so many years ago? You never criticize X and why do you criticize only Y? So, so those questions kind of trouble 
those who think that they are objective and fair. And I know of many commentators who have actually lost their balance. I mean, because there's so much a demand of equivalence mm. that if you're criticizing Congress, you need to also, uh, you know, if you're criticizing B uh, BJP, you need to criticize Congress. If you're criticizing Modi, you need to lose a seat to mm. deal with uh, Mr. Uh, Rahul Gandhi. So, you know, those <coughs> entire character has changed. Mm. And uh, with social media coming in, every word you write in a matter of few minutes, you find something which is like explosive. You'll get a, a few hundred or a thousand uh, responses, reaction. Since yesterday, we were talking, we uh, put out a tweet on Mandeep uh, Punia. And we find maybe after an hour or two, a few thousand people commenting, abusing, whatever, which, whichever way they come, you know, believe in. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Editors Guild uh, supposed to be a fuddy-duddy organization. People who don't understand technology mostly deal mm -hmm. with the newspaper and uh, their spoken word. Or, or largely the spoken word, but they don't know how to deal with the immediacy that social media brings into this entire conversation. Mm -hmm. So uh, one has to be careful, one has to be mindful, and we try to do that. But there are members who say that and who are awash all the time. There is a large troll army represented by, uh, you know, representing the political party, whichever they're fond of. Mm. And they're quick to jump on you and say nasty things about you. How do you think all of these, um, you know, various kind of new factors that are at play now um, that invariably affect the world of journalism, how do you think uh, they affect India's identity as a democracy at large? I mean, it's a difficult question fundamentally because too many things are happening. Firstly, uh, most of the newspapers and publications are no longer viable. Hmm. And uh, the revenue sources have uh, taken a beating. <clears throat> and also, you know, in this last one year, because of the pandemic, there have been no advertising. There is yeah. nothing that you can really do. And there is, I think, a bit of growth that the online publication may have seen, but this largely uh, crowdsourced uh, funding has been done. Uh, but otherwise, the media has been at the mercy of news uh, of the government. Mm. And uh, whatever money that may be coming to large publications comes from the government advertising or something very similar. And because this is a very sensitive government to a government very sensitive to criticism. Uh, there is no advertising that comes to you, even from the private sector, if the private sector realizes that it would antagonize the people in power. So it's a double whammy. So this economy, which is like in a miserable shape and you don't get advertising. And then you also have the advertisers who always are watchful over the, looking over their shoulder, how the government is going to react to it. Mm. I mean, in a situation like this, how can there be uh, So there is journalism? very difficult. Yes, I mean, media freedom is largely very, very difficult. <clears throat> and then you also have uh, the social media. Social media, as we have seen, is also very, very careful on, on issues pertaining to government. They would stop any Twitter handle. Uh, they would block anybody who makes a contrary noise, mm -hmm. like it happened to The caravan. Back. The caravan has been the caravan. The editor of Caravan is our treasurer. He is a, is a very intrepid, courageous magazine. And uh, they have been reporting unmindful of whatever, you know, harm may visit. I hope nothing does. But uh, they, they have uh, gone through a great amount of trouble because they don't look back. Can you tell us a little bit about what they've gone through uh, uh, that you're aware of? In the sense that uh, the editor of Caravan is also facing sedition charges, Indeed. you know, because he... Indeed. Uh, did a story and then it was tweeted and uh, there were reporters who I think were on the ground. To, uh, I think <coughs> their, their reporter reached about an hour after the, the person on the tractor died and uh, they followed the story like nobody else. I mean, they went to uh, places where the CCTV camera was there. They went to the village of the farmer. They went to the post-mortem. So it's a fantastic investigation they have done. And uh, at the face of it, very difficult to dispute. Hmm. Uh, you can't very difficult to contradict because a similar granular explanation would have to be provided by the government or whoever is disputing it. And I don't think anybody has the patience or the, uh, you know, the resolve to do it. But anyways, they did a great job. They, uh, they have uh, both the owner and owner's son. The uh, owner is the publisher and the, own, and the editor is the son, um, uh, Anantnath. They both are facing these charges. Only yesterday when the Supreme Court. They had done some other stories of, uh, you can say, 
uh, bravery. One was about uh, the murder of uh, a judge who was investigating a former um, our home minister, and he died in very dodgy circumstances. The matter, Supreme Court also did not take much cognizance of it. Uh, it was the entire perfunctory exercise which followed. So they have shown a kind of courage which is now becoming rare in Indian media. So that's that's what uh, it is. I, you know, you mentioned the Supreme Court here, and this is, uh, of course, uh, as journalists, we are the fourth pillar. But the judiciary is this um, key pillar in a functioning society, especially a democracy. Uh, do you feel that the judiciary in this in in India right now um, is as strong as it should be in a in a functioning democratic society? So uh, it's a I mean, judiciary should benefit from the separation of power. They should not look at how executive is going to conduct itself or what is coming on TV or which way the government or the public opinion is going. They have to stick to the law. They have to, you know, not be deviated by anything. But uh, sorry to say it's not the case because invariably a lot of... Uh, issues um, pertaining to protest, pertaining to resistance, pertaining to conflict are or uh, or being put on the back burner. I mean, I would expect that the Supreme Court would uh, have taken up the abrogation of uh, Article 370 in Kashmir. Mm. There were a number of habeas corpus issues uh, came up. They never paid any attention to it. So many people were missing. There was also uh, the major, uh, you know, pulse major part of that entire dispute was whether the action that the government has taken, the abbreviation of Article 370, which changed the status, was uh, in consonance with the basic structure of the constitution. Mm. And uh, at the face of it, you realize that it was flawed. And the uh, Supreme Court, if they would have confined themselves to the constitution, the law of the land, they would have probably thrown it out. So in the it's been almost two years, or little more than little less than two years, mm -hmm. and they haven't really uh, applied their mind to it. So Supreme Court uh, has come up short, and it, that has been a major cause of disappointment. And that is the reason you look at it. I mean, Supreme Court is offering to intermediate, to intervene in the farm protest, and the farmers are saying, "Thank you very much. We'd rather deal with the government because they are the ones who call the shots." <laughs> so you don't have much to say. So they offered to intervene. They tried, even offered that they will put the whole thing on hold for about 18 months. And in between, they would have a discussion or they would allow some kind of a committee to look into the problems of the farmers. But uh, the farmers are wiser. They say that, no, this is just to buy time. Nothing will come out of it. Uh, Mr. Kapoor, just from a historical perspective, all right, your experience, what kind of long-term implications can that have on a country and its citizenry when uh, they lose faith in such a large scale on such a key body, a key institution like the Supreme Court? So, uh, Supreme Court has gone through this phase. It's not that the first time <clears throat> it is happening, but it has the capacity to correct itself and there's a change at the top. You might get a Chief Justice of India who's able to look the government in the eye and, you know, pass a few judgments that change the very course of the judiciary. It might happen, maybe uh, happen after a year or two, because we, when you have institution, you cannot really lose hope. For instance, in the U.S., uh, Mr. former President Donald Trump appointed a justice to the Supreme Court, and one assumed that there would be some kind of help coming in, and then the uh, Supreme Court bench realized that you know there was Mr. Trump could not be rescued, so it changed the way that uh, politics was conducted mm -hmm. in the U.S. We hope here too. I mean, a uh, wiser council are going to prevail and their conscience will start pricking and they will ensure that the faith people have in the judiciary is restored somehow. Mm -hmm. Because in the long term, if you do not have an independent judiciary, uh, then it undermines democracy. Then you would have more people, more protests coming on the road because mm -hmm. they think, oh, there's nothing that the Supreme Court can do right. and there's nothing that we can, uh, we can take to the Supreme Court.
Another, um, we'll say, a, a sub, a, a footnote in this larger agitation, this farmers' protest, uh, a footnote protest that has recently happened that involves the Supreme Court and a fundamental human right, as declared by the Supreme Court, um, deals with the internet. So recently, um, in Delhi, in Haryana, large parts of the entire state of Haryana have uh, seen disruption in their internet, in their phone network service, um, and this has been openly announced by the uh, government officials. Uh, the Home Minister has said that we're disabling this. Um, so what kind of, uh, first of all, what kind of circumstances, um, you know, as someone who is a, a person in communication, uh, what kind of circumstances do you think, uh, if any, would justify uh, Cutting those lines of communication, especially the internet, in today's I think day no, age. no circumstances. I mean, if it has been recognized <coughs> that having an internet is a, a fundamental right, and uh, I mean, you haven't mentioned Kashmir, but this entire business started when the Kashmir uh, Article Three Seventy was abrogated, and uh, the government or the authorities, the administration decided that they needed to control the situation there, ensure that. Uh, there were no militancy. I don't know whether there's any link to that. They need to cut down the internet. And it remained like that for six to eight months. And they rec didn't recognize that uh, when you have a lockdown, when people are not allowed to move around, the internet is a lifeline. You can't do business because the e-business goes for a short. You can't study. You can't do a Google search to find out what you're doing. And so later on, uh, there was a lot of online education which was taking place from schools. Even that was not allowed. Mm. After much pressure and giving an impression of uh, doing a great favor to the people of Kashmir, they decided to provide them 2G at the time when it was 5G. So the pace was like crazy. Mm -hmm. So the matter went up to the Supreme Court. And Supreme Court, uh, to its uh, credit, uh, recognized that it is a fundamental right. But they did not put down a timeline, they did not give a very, very detailed instructions when that, uh, uh, you know, internet be restored in Kashmir. But uh, as I was telling somebody a short while back, there's somebody who interviewed me and he wanted to ask me about Kashmir and there was a, a newspaper which has been badly treated. And I said that tragedy is that what was happening in Kashmir is being replicated in the other parts of the country despite the fact that the circumstance of Kashmir and the rest of the country is very different. So, uh, the same uh, strategies are unfolding in uh, Haryana, you know, where you cut down the internet. Every time you have any violence, the, the district administration would uh, request uh, the internet authorities cut it down. And these people are forced <coughs> to, and it causes colossal, you can say, loss to the uh, internet providers, mm. uh, I'm not talking about the people, but even the providers lose a lot of money. Mm -hmm. I don't know how they get compensated. And if you look at the chart of uh, which countries are, uh, you know, cutting on internet, India figures right at the top. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that, uh, you know, in this current situation, um, once again, we're in Delhi, it's early February 2021, um, the internet uh, in parts of Delhi where the protests are taking place and large parts of the entire state of Haryana is still disabled. Do you feel the Supreme Court has um, an obligation or even uh, an ability to weigh in or have some kind of an impact in this situation? I think there is a recognition within the Supreme Court that sometime when they suggest something should happen may not be followed by the authorities. They would always find a reason that they could sidestep or kind of overlook what is expected of them. Uh, there was uh, this very famous judgment which was passed by the Supreme Court about 66A that if you have uh, if you write something in Facebook, it cannot be, you know, you cannot be holed up uh, like what was happening on the ground that you write some Facebook post and the police will come and they say that, you know, you have uh, done, uh, you know, engaged in a criminal act if it did not agree with the authorities. Mm -hmm. But success, uh, now, even now, despite this repeal, uh, people still get arrested by under 66A. I find it so absurd. So, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I, I know that the Supreme Court is... Doesn't, it doesn't feel very confident about uh, implementing. Would so you on. call it a lame duck Supreme Court? Uh, not really now, but they may uh, 
look more lame duck if they cannot get many of their orders implemented. They, they need to bite into something far more complex mm-hmm. than what they're doing at the moment. Mm-hmm. Uh, once again, if we're talking about the current uh, government and the authorities that are in power, um, do you feel that they would uh, allow that to happen or uh, be amenable to that kind of a uh, uh, challenge? So I think somebody needs to challenge them. Uh, I said, no, maybe one or two years from now, you may have a gut judge who looks the authority in the authorities in the eye. But uh, at the same time, I think uh, there has to be deepening of democracy. People need to ask questions. And I keep wondering as to why uh, uh, this government is feeling so vulnerable. This uh, government which got a majority, 300 odd seats, uh, and Mr. Modi is the most popular guy going around. And every survey suggests that, you know, he is the most popular person, claims that he handled the pandemic so well. There's so much to show for him. And then uh, why can't he deal with the farm protest? I mean, he should just, just talk with them. And I'm sure many farmers are reasonable people. They will go away if there is a promise, if there is some well-meaning kind of uh, conversation that takes place between the government and the protesting farmers. There is no reason why something like this should happen. You said um, why they're feeling um, so well, vulnerable. Um, <clears throat> would you characterize the recent escalation, specifically if we look at some of the images that have come out in the last few days around these border sites, the nails and the cement on the roads, the um, escalation in the fortification of the barriers, the you know erecting of actual cement walls where there was previously highways um, and, and entrance to these protest sites. Would you, would you kind of categorize that as also a display of vulnerability on the government's part? <laughs> I mean, this is, uh, I also see it a bit differently. I mean, there is one interpretation that it's a manifestation of, of vulnerability. But I also think that it's also meant to convey to the middle class in Delhi that we are keeping you safe from the Philistines who are crossing over from Punjab or Haryana or UP. And it is your interest to side with the government because time and again, it's the government's argument is that they are blocking the road and, uh, you, know, you know, upsetting the normal life and the other people who should be chased out finding some kind of justification, uh, providing justification for severe police action. So I think there is more to this point of view rather than feeling scared similarly. As someone who is obviously in this profession, but also a resident of Delhi, um, you know, on a personal level, does do those kind of actions, escalations and images that you frequently come across on social media, I'm sure, uh, give you any kind of reassurance that you're safe compared to maybe images of what the India-China border looks like or India-Pakistan border looks like? Yeah, in I comparison? think there's a great, it's a, it's a comparison which has been going around ever since that these fortifications have come up. But being a journalist, uh, these kind of the feelings that a common citizen would have are very different from mine. I mean, <coughs> I have uh, covered this conflict. I have covered many other things in different parts of the world. So it doesn't really uh, trouble me very much. But I think an ordinary person would be troubled. I said, you know, there's a nice uh, little life that they were leading. And suddenly they can't go in different direction. For instance, you should have been, you should have come to my place half an hour earlier. But you came uh, later because there were, you know, too many roadblocks and obstacles that have been put up by the authorities, fearing that, you know, you would have uh, farmers uh, moving all over the place. So, uh, you know, I think there is, there is a concern because I remember that when you had Anti-Citizen Amendment Act uh, protest in Delhi, so one of the things that uh, the BJP and the other political parties kept on saying that the protesters have no business to occupy public roads, you know, they should leave the roads and probably go to a park or somewhere. And that matter continued to fester for quite a while. And even when the uh, protest ended, many months later, you had a single member of the Supreme Court actually saying that, you know, you cannot have a protest on the public on a public road. And that is unacceptable. And he said that unmindful of the fact that it's a democracy. And when you disagree, you need to step out somewhere, you know. Yeah. So this is what happened. Um, sir, you, uh, you know, touched on a great point. I kind of want to dive into it a little bit. You said, uh, you know, this inconveniencing of the normal public, right, especially in Delhi, um, by erecting these barriers or creating conditions, right, similar to the ones that we're facing, trying to just get around the city. Um, you know, these kind of conditions do create disdain. Um, once again, talking about India as a democracy, uh, where do you place creating animosity or resentment amongst citizens for each other? 
Um, is that something that you would expect in a democracy or some other type of society? No, I think this is something which is a very, very dangerous trend which is being uh, dis uh, <coughs> witnessed at the moment, uh, pitting citizenry against citizens or uh, creating circumstances that, you know, the protesters are the enemies of the state and they need to somehow be chased out and uh, building public opinion around that uh, that in a future election benefits you somewhat. I think this is really harmful to democracy. It, uh, if it in any ways, uh, you know, you could criminalize dissent by the manner in which you go about it. And if it is not resolved, you know, you might just be giving a space uh, or giving, uh, you know, encouragement to people who are forced to pick up, a, uh, you know, weapons or arms to contest many issues. Mm. So this is totally unacceptable in a democracy. There is a space for conversation. There is a space for negotiation. There is a space for coming to a, a solution to complex issues. And that is why you have parliament. And one of the reasons why this uh, farm protest uh, festered or whatever happened is because the bills were not, uh, you know, there was no discussion in the parliament what the name. And they were passed after a voice vote. So if the government was keen that it should be done, they should, even now, they should announce, even they should put the farm bills on hold for a while and they say we will have a three or four day parliament session just to discuss the bill, a single point. Mm. And whatever comes out of it, we will go ahead and, uh, you know, they, will, they must show their intention that they are willing to listen to the other point of view. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you instead decide to criminalize anybody who's protesting, you see there is a dissent in the resentment that people have, then God save us. Um, how do you think that India and Indians will be, uh, you know, irreversibly changed after the events that have transpired in the last few months, specifically the farmers' agitation? You mean to say how India is going to change or Indians will, will be changed? I'm not very sure. I mean, I still, I was yesterday giving an interview and a similar question was asked of me and I said that there are a lot of people who are upset over this uh, very muscular politics as of now. But even now, if Prime Minister Narendra Modi says that, okay, I'm going to put the thing in hold and have a parliament session, everything will go back. Mm -hmm. Because uh, the people who are protesting, I don't think they hate the BJP. They don't. Because many of them have been voting for BJP. In Haryana, for instance, you have a party, uh, they, their party is in power. In uh, in Punjab, you had Akali Dal and the BJP, which was together. Mm -hmm. There is a support base. And similarly, in UP, the, all the Ghazipur people who are coming mm -hmm. is uh, because of the BJP supporters. So either you have supporters who are, uh, you know, voting for you because of some reason. Or maybe you, they think that you are a party which will look after their interests or uh, they are ideologically fragile who move from one party to another. But I don't think that uh, they are ha have lost their support. Hmm. Uh, so in, in a sense, uh, speaking to the party's benefit, uh, if they were to acquiesce um, to some of the demands that are put forth by the farmers and the farm union leaders, uh, they wouldn't necessarily from a, a party standpoint uh, be at a loss here is what you're saying. Yeah, it could be. Yes, absolutely. Um, once again, I want to come back to the field of journalism. That is your forte. Um, you know, there's always this kind of line that's drawn um, for folks that work in this sphere, right? That you are to objectively report the news, not become the news. But as of the last few days, um, you know, especially members of the Guild um, and other journalists that are, you know, doing the due diligence to cover this uh, movement objectively and make sure these stories get out, um, they have become the news, right? So how does the industry, how does the field of journalism and, and these some of these traditional journalists, even if they're, you know, their work is coming up on a digital screen somewhere, how do they maneuver in this new environment where they are both reporting and also the news? Yeah, it's a very common complex space and because you know <coughs> social media gives primacy to a personality more than say an organization although large organizations do not need the face of the editor to push anything like New York Times or the New Yorker uh, if there's something very interesting and compelling that is uh, there in the magazine or in the newspaper that will go on its own rather than even people looking at uh, who the editor is 
but unfortunately in in our times in in our country there are editors who want to i think driven by how many followers they might collect or what they will do always give an impression that uh, the more the follower the more the voice is going to reach different people so i think it is counterproductive in certain ways because um, the problems that we are facing now is also because of that because one of the uh, person who's facing sedition charges he's got about 6 million followers and uh, if the charge that the government has been leveling is that because you tweeted and it was unsubstantiated and that is the reason uh, the riots may have taken place because there's such a huge following so if a person like me or people who believe in the old adage that you know it is should be faceless you should not know them mm. i mean you know, the strength of your pen the strength of your writing is how a publication or individual should be known mm. uh, compared to that uh, i think uh, you know these these people who are more glory seeking could get uh, get it might get complicated because i have also seen some of the editors who are on twitter and they pass this kind of judgment that oh i used to follow, support the farm agitation but after these people went to the red fort no more support they forget the fact that if you are editor if you are a reporter you should be reporting rather than you know not really uh, push sides. put your neck out on what you love and what you don't love right nobody is asking you <laughs> the wise words um how do you see the the field of journalism specifically in uh, rapidly changing india uh move forward in these times so uh, i mean it's a very complicated very difficult time the thousands of journalists have lost their jobs in the last one year because of pandemic or even before that <laughs> but more so now and i fear that they'll never become journalists again even if circumstances improve some have some have taken up to uh, social media become facebook reporters do some stuff but i don't know how they'll make a living hmm. and uh, there is no revenue model that i see of uh, publications coming up who would improve um even online publications some of them have done uh, you can say crowd funding to raise uh, resources i don't know how uh, what is the longevity of uh, these uh, models how long will they last and i still believe that like leg- legacy publications have far greater greater chances like a new york times or dot times of india would be able to uh, you know adapt to new technology occupy mm-hmm. the same space and to go forward but it's a difficult difficult period for many 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 uh, full time journalists maybe if you are doing something else in life or if you have a wife working or a wife is a journalist and a husband is working maybe you could survive and like, practice some kind of media freedom otherwise very difficult and what does that uh, mean for once again india as a democracy if, if journalism has this no indian democracy i think also gets uh, very brittle uh, very uh, you know it comes under a great amount of strain because uh then the government uh and the large corporations end up controlling the narrative if there is nothing that uh, the journalists would be able to provide the other point of view so that they can make uh, i think informed democratic choices mm-hmm. and if they are not able to make informed democratic choices then democracy suffers because there's no independence that people exercise i mean <coughs> even in terms of technology if you look at it uh, if you been, if you followed the story about cambridge analytica uh, and how they were manipulating the internet and how they impacted both the brexit as well as the us election in 2016 then you would recognize that uh, mind can be manipulated change because some tech, uh, technological entity has built a psychographic profile about what information to give and so there's no freedom you know mm. so freedom is the essence of democracy and if that could be manipulated uh, then big life becomes far more difficult so that is why you have so many uh, you know authoritarian democrats who are coming in they mm. use democracy to come to power and use surveillance te- uh, surveillance technology they use other ways to ensure that the they continue to build a you know or have support of uh, their supporters or their power of their voters do you think that's happened in india yeah it's happening here it's happening in turkey it's happening in um, philippines is happening in hungary is happening in many other places um mr sanjay kapoor it was a pleasure speaking with you thank you so much for your time um i think that concludes our interview thank you very much for speaking with me on diverse topics and i thought i think uh, i hope it was useful
Absolutely, sir. Thank you. Thank you.